A very, very warm welcome to you all. Welcome to this uh, second webinar in our series on gender and chemicals. And today we're focusing on different sectors, namely labor and health. My name is Minu. I'm based in Berlin, Germany. I'm an associate to the MSP Institute. And the MSP Institute is a small charitable association dedicated to supporting high quality dialogue and collaboration among stakeholders, stakeholder participation and good governance. And uh, since 2017, we've been doing some work on gender and chemicals with support from the German Federal Environment Ministry and have uh, since been active in the cycling process of developing the strategic approach to international chemicals management beyond 2020, or should I now say beyond 2021. Anna Holthaus is coordinating our work on gender and chemicals and I'm advising. Um, and we can go to the next slide that gives you an overview uh, of our webinar series. Um, the first one, the recording is now available on our website, gender-chemicals.org, along with a number of links and materials that might be interesting for you. Today is the session on uh, labor and health, and then we have sessions planned on gender and chemicals in practice, practical projects on the ground, gender and the concepts of green and sustainable chemistry, gender and the UN system to look elsewhere, how the integration of gender is being achieved and gender and cycling beyond 2020. And we might have a few more lined up for next year because we have more ideas on what we could address. And if you do have things that you would like to share or projects that are interesting in this area, don't hesitate to contact us and maybe we can set something up. Um, so we have a series of very brief webinars, 45 minutes to avoid webinar overload um, with a clear focus and, and a time limit. We are recording this session and it will be made available on our website, just like the first one. Uh, and since we had over 100 registrations this time, let's see how this works out. We have also set up a live stream on YouTube. Uh, when people can't join, they can follow it there. So if you go to YouTube and you look for the MSP Institute channel, uh, you can watch that uh, as a live stream or you might want to tell a colleague who has a problem uh, logging in. That's the overview of the series and Anna. Yeah, before we begin uh, with the presentations of our guest speakers, I want to invite you to do a brief poll with me and um, let's see if this is working. So um, the first question to you is, which stakeholder group do you belong to? And I hope you can now see the question and answers on your screen. Um, so please, um, yeah. Click uh, your answer if you are either from an IGO, government, NGO, industry or science. And I see there are a lot of people from the NGO and some people from government. Um, let's wait a little bit. Mm. So you just have to click the answer and then I can see it on my screen and I will share it later. Um, so we can for see now, it. Hmm? We can see it. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. At least I can see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think I maybe, uh, yeah, um, I finished the, the question maybe a little bit too, too slow. Maybe we can do it again. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So you want us to do it again? Yeah, that would be perfect. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry. So, yes, there the results are other. In a, another way now, so I see a lot of NGOs, but also some people from government, IGO, industry, science, and other um, sectors. So that's really perfect. <laughs> Give you some time. Okay. Yeah. So now you can see the ah. results, and it's really nice because um, yeah, it's really nice that so uh, you are from so different stakeholder groups because in the second beyond 2020, um, the multi-stakeholder character is of central importance. So yeah, thank you very much. And for the second question, um, I invite you to please use your chat box now. Um, yeah, you'll find it below on the Zoom screen and uh, type your answer there directly so that we can all see your answers. Um, so the question to you is, what's the first word that comes into your mind when you think about um, gender, health and work? So please type it directly in the chat box.
Precaution, I see. Damaged health, health. missing. missing. Mm -hmm. Exposure, protection. Invisible. Inequities. Attention. Chemical contamination is just one word. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, wow, wow. Work-life balance, really interesting. Injustice. Yeah, injustice, biased, vulnerable. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Okay, exposure and equity. Yes, lack of awareness. Oh. Prevention. Prevention, yeah, I agree. Economy, yes. Yes, awareness required. We, we, we'll make a word cloud out of this and, and uh, put it on the website yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you very Thanks. much um, hmm. for your inspiring thoughts and uh, this brief brainstorming. And this leads me to our topic today, which is gender and chemicals in different sectors. Um, so uh, chemicals are omnipresent our daily life and that's why we can find interconnections of gender and chemicals in numerous sectors. In our first webinar last month, we gave some examples of gender issues in the pharma sector, uh, in the cosmetic industry, in agriculture and the chemical industry itself. Um, but to understand the dimensions of gender and the necessity of integrating gender into policies and programs, it's very useful to have a deeper look into the labor and health sector, um, because these sectors are both underlying a lot of different branches dealing with chemicals, um, and they are very much interconnected to each other. Um, and that's why we invited our two guest speakers today, Susan and Harshka. Thank you very much for joining us. So. Sorry, Nina, we can't hear you, and I will try to. Should be. To hear me now? Yes. Is that no. better? Okay, thanks very much. So, this is our agenda for the session today. We have uh, two presentations one by Halska Gracik, the Technical Officer in Occupational Safety and Health from the ILO, and by Susan Wilburn, the International Sustainability Director at Healthcare Without Harm. They both will be speaking around, I think, 12 minutes each. And afterwards, we have a, a bit of time for questions. We actually already received two questions beforehand. And I think Hashka will address some of the first question that we received. And Susan, I think, is also addressing some of the second question that we already received. Um, and, uh, and then we'll have some more time for questions and comments. And it's best maybe to use the chat for that, uh, like you've done just now for the poll. Um, if you have a technical problem, please also use the chat. We'll try and help. Uh, and if your connection isn't good, try it without using your video. Otherwise, keep on your video. It's nice to build a bit of a sense of community. But let's uh, turn to our first uh, guest speaker today. Allow me to welcome and introduce Halska Gracik from ILO. Halska holds a Master's of Public Health and a PhD with a specialization in occupational safety and health. She gained professional experience at the World Health Organization and with the Institute of Work and Health, assessing hazardous occupational exposures for vulnerable populations. She also worked as a project manager for the Swiss government, where she conducted environmental and occupational risk assessments in order to develop evidence-based public policies. Halschka currently serves as a technical officer with the International Labour Organization in Geneva, where she's responsible for backstopping the ILO's chemicals portfolio, which actually spans all work sectors and occupations worldwide and assesses hazardous exposures along the life cycle of chemicals and waste, including in global supply chains. Halschka, we are very happy that you were able to join us today. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Minu. Thank you for that um, very nice introduction. And thank you very much to you and to Anna for organizing this webinar. I just wanted to start by saying I think this is a very important topic that doesn't get enough attention. Um, I'm very glad to see so many people from all around the world from different stakeholder groups because, um, as you mentioned, Anna, this is something that we can't tackle just from one perspective. This is something that we really need all sectors to work together on um, from different stakeholder groups. So I will share my screen. I hope that it's working. Great. Can you see it? Yes. 
Excellent. Okay, good. I will start. So chemical safety at work, I will present the side of the labor sector, the world of work. This encompasses many different stakeholders. Um, as some of you know that are here with us, the International Labor Organization works with government stakeholders, mainly through our ministries of labor, but also through other ministries with our workers organizations, as well as our employers organizations. So some of the key points of today's presentation, I won't be doing a deep dive as we have a limited amount of time, um, but I hope to get through some of the main points and hopefully can address your questions. Uh, so what's really essential to highlight is that recognizing worker diversity is essential, and this really includes the gender aspect. So this is critical for different types of occupational safety and health control measures, both at the national level and at the workplace level. And they're very important because there are so many different factors that can impact how chemicals can affect workers' health. So these can range from social to biological, and unfortunately, in some cases, stereotypical stereotypes as well. Uh, and when we consider the effect of chemicals, we need to look at two parts of the equation. So first, we need to look at exposure scenarios and how they differ. But we also need to take into consideration that after exposure occurs, the health effect may be dramatically different uh, based on worker characteristics. So based on all of the evidence so far that we've seen, uh, we know that there's a number of different recommendations that we have, a number of research areas that we need to uh, emphasize, and I'll be glad to go through some of those so we could think also together on how we can move forward with this agenda. So let's start on the side of exposure characterization. Um, at a workplace, there are many different exposure scenarios that can take place with chemicals. Um, and chemicals, sometimes this, when we talk about chemicals at the workplace, it sounds a bit limited. We think of chemical industries. But the truth is that chemical exposures occur across all workplace sectors in many workplace tasks. Um, this ranges not just from chemical industries, but also to mining, agriculture, manufacturing, um, a lot of exposures in the informal sector. So we're really talking about a vast array of exposures. And because of different social and occupational roles, as well as stereotypes, uh, men and women really can face different types of exposures based on, first of all, the chemicals that they encounter, the magnitude of their exposure, and the duration of their exposure. And it's really difficult here to make generalizations, to say that uh, in one part of the world or in one specific industry, it's really men or women that are exposed. So there are a number of different factors that determine exposure. This is what we've seen from our research. Um, and so it's hard to say that only in this sector we have women exposed or men exposed and to this type of chemical or X type of chemical. So this really requires um, an evidence-based approach that we're trying to build on at the, at the ILO. So our most recent um, survey that we did looked at different occupations by gender. Um, this is looking at more of the formalized sector, um, but we see that women tend to be more, tend to be part of the workforce in greater numbers in um, tasks such as personal care or in, as health associates, also cleaners and helpers, health professionals, uh, food processing, woodworking, garments, and related trades. So there's areas where women tend to be um, more likely to participate in these occupations. And we see that in a number of them, uh, there's a greater potential for exposure to chemical substances, such as cleaners and helpers, um, in the health so associate field, of course, in woodworking and textiles. This is a very big source of exposure to chemicals. So this is just one of the breakdowns that we have, uh, to give you a broad perspective on this. But there's many different issues to take into consideration, even when we see these numbers. So first of all, um, the trends have shown that men tend to work in industries that include exposures to carcinogenic substances or those that may cause chronic diseases such as respiratory diseases um, or different types of systemic uh, illnesses. Um, while this has been the case for many years, we see that, unfortunately, the work that's taken, undertaken by women because of this, um, this trend is presumed to be less hazardous. So therefore, these occupations, these work tasks might receive less attention when it comes to very important workplace practices, things like 
workplace risk assessment um, that is participative or worker trainings. Um, so we see that sometimes because of these ideas that we have that men tend to work in these more hazardous sectors, um, we sort of pull back when it comes to critical um, workplace measures where women tend to be, you know, uh, more, uh, more represented. Uh, in addition, we found uh, through some of our research that a number of work tools, but also prote personal protective equipment, uh, PPE, is really designed for the Western male body. So because of this, there can be poor fits. Um, this can lead in many cases to reduce protection. Sometimes workers that don't use PPE at all because it's too bulky, it's uncomfortable, it doesn't fit correctly, so there fe it feels like it's actually doing more harm than good. And of course, if you have bulky materials, this could lead to increased risk of accidents at the workplace um, and also exposure. So we've seen this when it comes to welding because welding helmets um, are a very important piece of equipment. However, they're very heavy and they're designed for a certain size of a worker's head. And if they're too big, they tend to fall. Um, we've seen in some cases that workers are using sunglasses um, or other types of protection instead of a welding helmet, um, which is very important also to protect from uh, the fumes that are generated in metal welding. Uh, in addition, we found that women tend to have less decision-making powers because they are not usually um, the heads of certain enterprises and also less representation in workers' unions as well as occupational safety and health committees. So now when we look at sort of the health effect considerations, so the other side of the puzzle, um, there are a number of differences that are biological um, based in physiology or based in hormonal pathways that can create certain susceptibilities to toxic chemicals. Uh, particularly, we see a rising increase of exposure for chemicals that have interactions with hormonal pathways. So this, these are things like endocrine disrupting chemicals, perfluorinated chemicals. Um, we've seen in the evidence that there's more and more uh, women's effects when it comes to reproductive hazards and also um, hormonal pathways, for example, that regulate the thyroid function. Um, so we see that even at really low doses, exposure to these types of chemicals can elicit really dramatic effects and unfortunately sometimes irreversible. So um, female workers are particularly high risk, of course, during their childbearing years, during pregnancy, during breastfeeding. Uh, this is a very critical exposure window for women. Um, but also we need to look at male exposures because we see that a number of these chemicals can also exert harmful effects on the reproductive system of men and reduce fertility, reduce, reduce sperm counts. Um, so this is, you know, when we talk about these issues, we have to be also gender inclusive, um, even though research has really focused on male exposures and has sometimes left um, women behind, we also need to consider the different types of um, reproductive health hazards that chemicals, um, chemicals can exert. Um, what's interesting too when we talk about um, persistent chemicals is the fact that a lot of heavy metals um, and persistent pollutants, things like pesticides, can really accumulate in adipose tissue. And women tend to have, um, first of all, higher levels of adipose tissue, but also more propensity to store these chemicals in this tissue. And because these chemicals can bioaccumulate, this means that the danger, for example, for a woman, um, doesn't just occur when she's pregnant. If there has been exposure to bioaccumulative chemicals before pregnancy, these chemicals are still present in the body and can exert an effect on the developing fetus. So the time windows are very important, but we have to also consider um, that we can really have a lasting effect, a chronic effect from some of these chemicals. And so um, some of the case studies that are particularly important for us um, are pesticides, highly hazardous pesticides in agriculture. Um, sometimes we see a division of labor in agriculture that um, um, if men are doing the more heavy work, such as cutting down of some of the, the plant matter or doing some of the hanging, they're not always responsible for the pesticides, which is seen as sometimes um, an easier task because of it could be mixed by um, could be mixed you know on the side of the field and then sprayed it's not seen always as something that um, is too labor intensive and therefore sometimes women take over that role as here you see an ILO photograph of a woman in a tobacco field in Malawi 
with her child on her back, which happens often because women are also responsible for childcare and can uh, take in many cases their children to work with them. Um, so heavy metals and mining I'll talk about on the next slide, but also I wanted to raise the point of the informal sector. Uh, we've seen that in industries such as dismantling of e-waste, uh, women tend to be a significant part of the workforce. You know, this is sedentary work. This is work that can be done inside the home. Um, in many cases, if men are traveling and women are behind, this is something that can be done as a way to generate uh, income for the household that can be done, you know, in a rather an easily way easy way that it's done within the home. And so there doesn't need to be um, any travel involved and therefore women are able to do the housework, take care of the children, but also um, contribute to the economic activity of the household. And therefore we see greater exposures um, for women in this case. So to give a quick case study on um, women in artisanal gold mining operations, I chose this case study because this is something that I've witnessed uh, firsthand in the field. Um, that in many small scale gold mining operations, you see a very clear division of labor. The men are the ones that are doing the heavy tasks, breaking the ore, crushing the rock, moving rock, things that uh, demand greater physical um, strength. Uh, and sitting by the riverside or by the lakeside or where, wherever there's a water source and doing the sifting of the crushed ore and mixing it with mercury, which will then amalgamate with the gold that's present in the ore. This is seen as um, easier work, so to speak. This is seen as something that's sedentary that you know a woman can do also um, if she has her children with her, they can sit by the river. And so there is a very clear division in many of these mining places. Now I'm not trying to make a generalization, but this is what um, we've seen in certain countries. And sometimes it differs between mining operations, of course. Um, but also on the health effect side, uh, we have to remember that mercury is a reproductive hazard. It can lead to many um, abnormalities when it comes to the development of the fetus um, and also spontaneous abortion. But we see also that because, as I mentioned, this bioaccumulation that happens because of heavy metals, um, we see that this is a burden that can last for many years, it's not something that's just related um, to the immediate time of work. And mercury exposure is a big risk for infants and children that are also present at the mining sites. And this could lead to neurodevelopmental effects in children. And so we see that we have secondary exposures because of the fact that women often are at these mining sites uh, doing this work. Uh, that children are also at a greater risk for exposure. That is something to take into consideration. Um, I would like to touch on occupational cancers because while accidents at the workplace and poisonings are important, we see more and more that chronic health effects and specifically cancers um, are starting to become some of the most important illnesses at the workplace. And while a lot of occupational studies don't report on gender disaggregated data, we do see that there's increased cancer rates in female workers exposed to certain chemicals. And this is really an alarming trend. This is something that's been flagged. Um, one of the biggest sectors for this, for occupational cancers and female exposures has been in agriculture, where we've seen a number of highly hazardous pesticides um, that lead to female cancers, breast cancer specifically. And there's been a hypothesis that this might be linked to a cellular response. So the mechanism of action could most likely be gender specific. And this is very important for our future research to better understand how this works. Because what we can learn from this is that perhaps we need to have classification of certain occupational hazards, specifically those that are chemicals, um, on a gender-based approach. So this is something that we need to consider for the future when we're, we're making policies. Um, so overall, we have evidence. We have a number of scientific reports. We have a number of um, case studies that have shown us these differences for gender exposures and also gender health effects. But we still have very limited research and we still sometimes struggle to fully develop the story. So even if we have one or a, even a handful of studies, um, it's difficult to make clear associations. It's really difficult to say that this certain exposure is leading to you know, a gender um, specific response. And for this reason, we really need more research that is gender disaggregated 
uh, we, need we need physiological, but also toxicological studies that look at these aspects, both from, from the exposure and also the outcome side. Um, and we need to make sure that when we carry out the research and we have the evidence, that this evidence is then linked to make sure that we have proper reporting and diagnosis of occupational diseases, because sometimes we also have a bit of a gender bias when it comes to diagnosing occupational diseases, namely for cancers. Um, so we've seen that women tend to be underdiagnosed and underreported uh, when it comes to occupational disease registries around the world and even in developed countries. So now to touch a bit on the ILO role and response. So the ILO was founded really on the concept of guaranteeing the protection uh, for the health of workers, uh, and this includes all workers. So all workers are covered by international labor standards, and moreover, um, workers, their families, and their communities are covered because it is understood in our legal instruments that workplace exposures do not end at the factory walls, but in fact um, have a very big effect on the family of the worker, but also on the larger community. And so we have 50 legal instruments that are specific to workers for chemical hazards. Again, these legal instruments cover all workers. Uh, they range from different sectors, from agriculture to mining, but also they look at specific hazards such as benzene, asbestos, and also health outcomes, things like occupational cancer. Um, something that I find very important is that the ILO has its own maternity prevention convention. Again, this is an international labor standard. This is a legal instrument. Uh, countries that ratify uh, this convention are obliged to implement its provisions. And I invite you all, because you're from so many different countries here, to uh, look and to see if your country has ratified um, some of the chemical conventions, namely Convention 170, but also the Maternity Protection Convention. Um, so this convention gives specific provisions um, to ensure that pregnant women should not be obliged to carry out work that is a risk to herself or to her child's health, and that there is an elimination of any workplace risk through, the, um, through carrying out risk assessments, and also protection via paid leave and the protection for the right to return to her job as soon as it's safe for her to do so. Um, and our, our recommendation number 191 gives specific provisions um, for the practical aspects of implementing this convention. Um, in addition, we've uh, published a number of different guidances for gender mainstreaming and occupational safety and health. Um, we tend to always look through a gender lens when we're carrying out our projects in the field. This is something that's been very important to the ILO um, because of this reason that we ensure that all of our conventions and legal instruments really cover all workers at the workplace. Um, and that there is not discrimination based on gender, but also on other worker characteristics. So some of the takeaway points today, uh, I really want to underline the the fact and the points that um, different societal roles and expectations have really led to unique exposure scenarios. Um, and really, if we want to design proper control measures, we can no longer afford to be gender blind. Um, when we talk about these different control measures, they range from many different options. And all stakeholders have a role to play in implementing these different control measures. This can range from things like carrying out gender sensitive research, um, translating that research into evidence-based policies, um, things that can you know, lead to the classification of hazards, of chemical hazards uh, on a gender basis, things like occupational exposure limits. And when we talk about these policies, it's very important that we consider that policies can be implemented at all levels and we're really not limited um, when it comes to how we implement them. So this could be at a national level, this can be at a local level and at a workplace level. So pulling in the idea of all these different stakeholders that really have a role to play in the different levels, identifying where those are um, and contributing in their own way. I would say that there's no task that is, um, that is too small. All of us can contribute in our own way to ensuring that um, gender considerations are taken into account. Um, so I would like to close here. I hope I summarized this the best I could. I am very open to take any comments or questions from anyone and to elaborate on these 
fully maybe after Susan's presentation as well. So thank you very much. Um, Minu, I cannot hear you. Okay, that should work. No. No, Thank you. Fine. Sorry, because um, I don't have hosting powers this time. So um, anyway, thank you very much, uh, Hashka, for this detailed presentation, for the data, the examples, uh, but also the insights into ILO's work. And uh, uh, when you were closing the... Uh, um, the insights into what different actors really need to be doing, including at all levels. So thank you very much. Uh, we do take uh, the second presentation right now and then hope to have a bit of time for questions and comments. I'd like to introduce uh, Susan Wil Wilburn as our second guest speaker. Susan holds a Bachelor in Nursing and a Master's of Public Health. She's the International Sustainability Director at Healthcare Without Harm. In that capacity, she manages the organization's healthcare waste management and mercury elimination project in Africa with UNDP and WHO, and the sustainable health and procurement project in 10 countries with UNDP. She represents health sector civil society on the Bureau of the International Conference on Chemicals Management, so she has a key role in the CYCAM Beyond 2020 process. Before joining Healthcare Without Harm, Susan worked as a technical officer at the World Health Organization in Geneva. And she, Susan now actually lives on a small boat on the Silas Sea on the west coast of the United States, a fact that has sparked a lot of daydreaming among all of us over the weekend. Thank you very much, Susan, for sharing this. And thank you for getting up so early. Good morning to you and uh, thanks for your contribution. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Minu, and many thanks to the MSP Institute for organizing this webinar. It's a pleasure to be with you and to talk about this subject that's so important. And I'm going to talk specifically about the health sector and about the use of chemicals in the health sector and cover the following points in the next 10 minutes. Um, one, as, as Halshka, and thank you, Halshka, for the presentation and setting the stage for understanding both the science and the inequities of research and the application of protective measures for all genders and the impact on, on women and men in the workplace. What, as Halshka pointed out, the health sector is 60 to 74 percent female. And so all of these hazards, the chemical hazards uh, from chemicals used in the health sector are having an impact, um, a um, disproportionate impact on, on women in the workplace because women are the greatest proportion. Um, one of the things that is unique and interesting is that the chemicals in use in the health sector are oftentimes therapeutic chemicals. And so, while they are appropriate for the individual for whom the chemical is aimed, if these are pharmaceutical agents like drugs, but it's not appropriate that the health worker should be exposed to the same. So I'll speak a little bit about hazardous drugs and about anesthetic gases. Um, but the other component is, as Halshka pointed out, when women are in the workplace, they're considered not working in the hazardous occupations. And so often the um, general occupational hazards and chemical exposures are um, not considered fully or not taken as seriously because this is, quote, women's work and it must be safe. And this shift has taken a long time to recognize. It was in the early 1990s that research in the United States showed that health workers were more at risk from occupational disease and days lost from work than were um, workers in the mines, in construction, or in professional football. Um, so 
but this is still a long time coming that women require additional protections in the workplace. So I'll talk about the hazards. I'm gonna talk about this system in occupational health of the hierarchy of control. I will also speak a bit about the increased use of chemicals in the face of the global pandemic. And I'm very happy to see many of my colleagues on this webinar and um, colleagues from around the world and wish you all well during this very challenging time that we're having. And um, again, I'll speak a bit about the excess use of chemicals in the face of disinfecting chemicals in the face of the coronavirus. So uh, looking at the chemical hazards broadly in the healthcare setting, and here you can see on the slide a division between occupational exposures and patient or community exposures. The topics that I have bolded are ones that I'm going to pay a bit more attention to. So um, the, the topics that I will pay less attention to include, as I mentioned at the beginning, the hazardous drugs and chemotherapeutic agents. Um, if you're a health worker treating a, pac a patient with cancer, you should not be exposed to those anti-neoplastic drugs, which are carcinogens in themselves. So many of, there are many hazardous drugs in the healthcare workplace for which health workers should not be exposed. And they are carcinogens, they are mutagens, they cause reproductive hazards and spontaneous abortion and immunosuppression. So the way that we ensure that only the person for whom the the uh, chemical is aimed is exposed is quite important. I'll speak more about waste anesthetic gases, disinfecting and sterilizing agents. Halschka spoke a lot about pesticides and highly hazardous pesticides. Well, these are used extensively in healthcare settings to avoid pest and control um, the and loading docks and on grounds of hospitals. So managing pesticides in healthcare settings is important. Um, latex allergy affects between eight to 12% of health workers. And I'll talk a bit about the use of gloves, appropriate use of gloves. Community exposures include um, from dioxins and furans, from the incineration of healthcare waste, which is an endocrine disruptor and a carcinogen. Halschka has already spoken about mercury in terms of the health effects of this potent neurotoxin. Um, however, in healthcare, mercury is used on a daily basis in many settings, although in this year, the Minamata Convention on Mercury requires the end of the use of mercury-containing thermometers and blood pressure measuring devices by the end of 2020. However, they're still in wide use and there is exposure to mercury when those, um, when those pieces of equipment either break a thermometer or in the case of filling, refilling a blood pressure device with mercury. There are alternatives that are safe, that are equally effective for measuring um, blood pressure and temperature um, and again, the Minamata Convention requires that they be implemented. Um, one of the high level disinfectants, ethylene oxide, is both a chemical hazard in the health workplace where used for sterilization and also community, there have been community clusters of cancers, um, blood type cancers like leukemia as a result of community exposure when this chemical is used to sterilize equipment. And I'll speak a bit about um, polyvinyl chloride and diethyl hexyl phthalate, PVC and DEHP in its use in healthcare settings. Um, the most important content of my presentation is this, how one can control exposure and control illness or injury as a result of uncontrolled exposure. This hierarchy of controls comes to us from the field of occupational health, although it is applicable much more widely than that. And as you can see, that the most important control measure is to eliminate the exposure or eliminate the hazard altogether. So in many cases, and as we're thinking about disinfection during this time of COVID, soap and water is very disruptive to the um, coronavirus capsule, it's a really effective means for infection control and much less toxic than some of the highly hazard, hazardous disinfectants. 
other ways that one can eliminate exposure or eliminate chemicals altogether is one example in healthcare settings is often we wax floors. Then you need a floor degreaser, stripper, which is an asthmogen and a sensitizer. So if you don't wax your floor and just keep it clean, you don't need to have the additional application of wax and stripping. Um, and the use of non-burn treatment technologies, which I'll speak more about. Then continuing down the hierarchy where you can't eliminate hazard, what can you do to substitute that hazard for something less hazardous? Again, alcohol hand rub versus some of the disinfectants. Here's diff different types of substitutions for hazardous chemicals in the health workplace. And if you can't substitute, what can you do to engineer out exposure to the hazard with closed systems for instrument disinfection and anesthetic gas, improved ventilation, and then there's the administrative and work practice controls, like the implementation of the globally harmonized system for classification and labeling of chemicals, which many of your countries have now put into policy so that workers are receive information and training and safety data sheets about the chemicals in use and how they can protect themselves and what their rights are um, for protection from exposure or rights during pregnancy. Work practice controls are the means by which you use particular chemicals. For example, again, with surface disinfection, instead of spraying to apply it, um, to pour it onto a, a, a cloth so it doesn't aerosolize and to make sure that chemicals are diluted appropriately. You'll see that last but not least on this list of control measures is personal protective equipment like respirators. And while these are critically important, they are not the most effective means to prevent and control exposure. Now, just to take a, a deeper look at three of the hazards, as I mentioned, anesthetic gas is not only a occupational health hazard in terms of adverse reproductive outcomes, spontaneous abortion, and congenital abnormalities. It has central nervous system effects that you can see, and it is, in addition, a very potent greenhouse gas. So managing anesthetic gas so workers are not exposed and that we do not off gas as um, the, the greenhouse gases onto the environment. And you can see on the screen, there's various control measures about how we minimize the use of nitrous oxide, how we reduce flow rates, um, eliminating the most potent greenhouse gas, which is also a potent occupational hazard, and substituting the intravenous anesthetics for um, aerosolized or gases with, again, important that are closed systems so that, and you can see in the photo, a closed system for anesthesia administration um, from a hospital in Germany where um, the closed system will prevent exposures. Moving on to disinfectants and this use of disinfecting tunnels during the time of COVID-19, there has been a proliferation in both healthcare settings as well as municipal and transport settings throughout the globe in all continents we've seen as a result of research that my organization, Healthcare Without Harm, did to both find the implementation of disinfecting tunnels as well as research on the health impacts the WHO then followed by publishing this myth buster that says spraying any kind of disinfectant should not be done because it isn't, that number one is not effective and number two um, is a health hazard. WHO, the World Health Organization did start to ask poison centers globally what problems they've had connected with the use of disinfectants and you can see on the screen that children and the elderly have been most at risk in home settings from the excess, excessive use and access of disinfectants, both in terms of mixing chlorine-based hypochloride products with other products that off-gas um, and ingestion by children and the elderly, confused elderly of um, various disinfectants. So you the the um, Link here is to um, the Centers for Disease Control, Morbidity and Mortality weekly report about the 20% increase in poisoning 
related to disinfectants that have occurred in the US. Um, the good news is we have, there's a lot of work on choosing safer disinfectants. And this is an example from the Vienna Hospital Association. It's a database called VDES for choosing safer disinfectants. And it's work that we have done research together with the Vienna, um, the VDES system in the Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network to identify what disinfectants are in use and how to use them more safely. Um, the most commonly used plastic, and there's been a lot of attention to plastics in the ocean, but the most commonly used plastics in healthcare settings is polyvinyl chloride, which in its production and in its incineration causes dioxin, the subject of the Stockholm Convention. And the um, important quality of PVC is that it is rigid when produced, and so it needs to be softened or plasticized with DEHP, which is a reproductive hazard and associated with, um, with birth defects. Um, and this is, has an impact on both male and female fetuses. So the, one of the many solutions to reducing dioxin production from um, the, the incineration of PVC is to change the treatment technologies. And we have worked together with WHO and UNDP in a number of countries globally over the past um, over 10 years to implement what is a large scale autoclave and a small scale autoclave and a pressure for healthcare waste minimization and the appropriate treatment of healthcare waste to prevent the production of persistent organic pollutants. I wanted to share with you in closing a few resources that are available, resources available from WHO, from Healthcare Without Harm and UNDP and the ILO and WHO. Um, WHO developed the WHO Chemicals Roadmap to Enhance Health Sector Engagement in SICAM, the Strategic Approach to International Chemicals Management. Healthcare Without Harm produced this document on chemicals in the health and environment and look forward later this fall to a new document specifically about chemicals in the use in health settings and case studies about their substitution. And then on the right, you'll see the HealthWise manual from WHO and ILO, which has a chapter on occupational health dealing with how to manage chemical hazards, as well as chapters on work organization and chapters on infectious hazards. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And um, if you want further information about how hospitals across the world have substituted safer chemicals, go to the greenhospitals.net case studies on chemicals and you'll find stories from all of the countries that you see on the screen that are active. In, we have now um, almost 40,000 hospitals in 72 countries that are active in this network of the global green and healthy hospitals working for sustainability and healthcare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Thanks for, for uh, analyzing and showing us the different problems and problematic substances, but also focusing on what uh, can be done, what is agreed uh, um, in, in terms of the hierarchy, uh, but also, you know, just practical tips. Uh, and it's lovely to see a network of over 40,000 hospitals. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, we've gone a little over time and uh, most of you are actually all of you are still here so I'm assuming we can add a few more minutes and make take the advantage of Halshka and Susan being here to answer a few questions that you may have um, there's already two questions in the chat um, yes we will share the presentations on our website so that's one that's the third question then Ramsa from uh, uh, he has asked about Cydex and he's asking for alternatives for this chemical. Um, I'm just looking at both of you in case uh, you can respond and I'm uh, reading the second question as well. Um, so you can prepare Susan and Hashka. Uh, the other one is from Riska, uh, talking about rice farming and palm, palm oil farming uh, and says that there are highly hazardous pesticides being used, but they don't have a, a researcher with a medical background available. Um, and the question is, uh, is there a simple tool to measure the impact uh, or hazard level of workplace exposure to workers in, in the rice farming and palm oil setting? 
So uh, I'm looking at the two of you. Is uh, anyone want to take one of those questions on? Susan, you have your microphone on. Go ahead. I'll start with the question about Cydex. The, that's the brand name for um, glutaraldehyde, which is a high level disinfecting chemical widely used in healthcare settings, particularly to disinfect sco endoscopes that are used for um, looking at the, the, um, the system, the GI gastrointestinal system. Um, there are many alternatives to uh, the use of glutaraldehyde for high level disinfection. It is an asthmogen and a sensitizer. And as the colleague points out, it has banned, been banned in many countries. And particularly what has happened even where it hasn't been banned is that countries have set exposure limits to reduce asthma and sensitization among health workers. And because it is nearly impossible to reduce exposure to meet those safer limits, the, the products have been taken off the market and stopped in use. Some of the alternatives include a parasitic acid and hydrogen peroxide, and they're widely used. And um, with permission, with your permission, Minu, I will add some of the resources on how to substitute uh, glutaraldehyde and the case studies I showed also already have um, some examples of that from a couple continents. Thank you very much Susan. So everybody we will share the presentations and Susan will amend hers to include those uh, resources uh, so you can download them on the on the page where we're also sharing the webinar recording and if you do have to leave um, you can come back of course and watch the recording for the uh, for the remainder of the questions and answers. Halshka, did you want to make a comment? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so the question of highly hazardous pesticides, um, absolutely, in rice farming and palm oil especially, there are a number of, unfortunately, um, HHPs that are used. Um, I think the most important thing is also to realize that when we talk about measuring the impact or the hazard level. Um, so these are two different things that we can do. Um, the ILO has a number of guidances on the safe use of agrochemicals. Um, my email was on the presentation that will be shared. I'd be happy to share those specific guidances with you. Um, and also it, there's just to piggyback on a little bit what Susan said, because this is applicable when we're talking about chemicals we need to ensure that we have appropriate occupational exposure levels. And this is the most important point, is that we cannot measure really the effect of the exposure if we don't know what the exposure is. And so the most important first step is to assess the actual level of exposure and see if it's in correspondence with the occupational exposure limits um, that have been set for the specific uh, pesticide or this group of pesticides. Um, now on the outcome effect, on the outcome, um, we also have a number of different guidance materials that can assess the, what will happen with the outcome. And so the occupational disease list of the ILO specifically mentions um, diseases that are caused by agrochemicals. So this is something that, um, that I can also share and would be happy to discuss further because I could talk about it for a long time here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I think we, we should, uh, you know, kind of uh, close in a few minutes, but uh, there's, a, there's another question I'd like to just pick from Helen uh, Lynn from the UK. How do we protect okay. the developing fetus, given many women may not confirm their pregnancy for the first three months? Bioaccumulated chemicals will also affect the fetus. Where do we set the stop posts for the exposures? Um, Halshka, Susan, do you want to make a brief comment? I can make a brief one, if I may. Um, I think that this is a very difficult question and that's why we try to always, to not limit uh, vulnerability to pregnancy. So that's why we always say childbearing age as well, because we know that, that, um, that the chemical exposures won't just suddenly start when there is a pregnancy, but in fact um, can happen many years before and bioaccumulate. So we try to address this issue by making sure that women also of childbearing age are protected. Um, Thank you. Maybe one last one. Yeah, Susan, go ahead. Just add quickly that what we have learned with the, the chemicals for which we've studied for many years, like lead and mercury, is the more research comes in that the less and less levels of exposure to those chemicals are safe. And so how we manage from the very beginning to both 
um, produce safer chemicals, more sustainable chemicals in production, as well as manage those in use with, the, with a full level of precaution. Thank you very much. Thanks to the two of you. I, I think I'm just going to take one more um, because many people do remain. So uh, uh, indulge us. There's a question about blood uh, lead level among waste workers in Nepal. And it's a specific question to you, Halshka, I think, uh, about what can ILO help to rectify such a problem? Uh, blood lead levels. So the, the ILO is a member of the International Coalition for or the Lead Alliance. Um, so we've been working with our stakeholders in many countries to try to understand what are the issues. So this is already where we start. So flagging an issue. This is where we can understand what is the sector at risk, who are the workers at risk, um, how can we work together at the workplace and also at the national level to see what policies are missing. So doing a gap analysis for the um, specific legislation that's related to chemicals. Um, and then work with the different tripartite stakeholders that I mentioned before uh, to see how we can work together to implement policies both at the workplace and the national level. So there's many different ways um, that we work, but I think the implementation of policies that are participative, so that work with these tripartite constituents, um, and are really responsive to the specific issue in the specific sector, because as I mentioned before, these can vary so widely. Um, so, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks to, to, to both of you um, for your presentations and for quickly, quickly answering questions and sharing resources. Uh, everybody, you might also have seen in the chat, uh, there's been some resources and, and uh, tips uh, and information being shared. We're going to save that chat too and uh, make it available for you to download so you can access that information at any time. And I think I'm just going to hand over to Anna to close. Yes. Thank you. So at the end of our webinar, I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, Susan and Halschka. Um, if you have further questions, then please check our website, jedna-chemicals.org. There you will find the recording of today and the presentations of our guest speakers. And um, join us next time, September 29, at the same time, um, on gender and chemicals in practice. And there, uh, we want to discuss experiences of integrating gender and chemicals management projects um, on the ground. Yeah, so thank you very much. And I wish you all a very nice day. <laughs> thanks very much. Thanks to Susan and Halschka in particular. Thanks very much for joining us. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mina.